My name is Ali Misalifu. I'll be walking us through the topic on safeguarding the long-term future. So we are going to look at it from, if we ask ourselves, is it a matter of mind shifting or multi-perspectivity? What do we mean? You know, as we sit, you know, as you all sit, you are all seated here, you know, I'm standing here. I'm not sure that you can see this side of me, right? So that is how it happened with various issues that we face as human beings. So this is why we need to look at this topic from various perspectives. The question is, why should anyone care about the future, the long-term future? So this is not just a presentation. And I'm afraid that I might not be able to meet your, up with your expectation. But the purpose is to keep us asking ourselves, why the long-term future? So if you look at this date here, this is August 14. Uh, 1912, and that, at that time, scientists were, you know, warning policymakers, business, you know, sector, and others about the impact of, you know, uh, coal, you know, at that time. So, if you look at this year to today, it's almost a hundred years, you know, a hundred year. Sorry, then that means we tend to minimize the effect of our actions, you know, in the long term. So look at this second picture here. We are having a kind of, you can see smoke coming from, maybe it's a nuclear plant. Then we can see generally what it has translated into. So this is what, why, you know, we need to care about, you know, the long term future, including you. Because I, I'm sure that many of us you know, took some flights, you know, some from the UK, some from Kenya. Sorry if I'm mentioning Kenya or other because I know that some people came from Kenya and the UK. So you, you see the amount of emission, you know, on the plane and all that. They actually have impact on our environment. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have sessions like this because I think the trade-off is bigger than, you know, just sitting down and not doing anything. So we are going to look at what scientists, scientists call planetary boundaries. So if you look at this date, almost a year now, and this is, you know, the normal planetary boundaries. But as you can see, we are having some, you know, reaching to some kind of high risk zone in terms of how we have been crossing these various boundaries. Uh, are we talking about land system change? You know, for instance, here we have moved away from the normal limit. Then we come to change in biosphere, integrity, and climate change, of course. So look at all this, you know. If you are able to, if you visualize this, you understand that all these little actions or inactions, they are adding up and they have consequences. Even as we speak, speak today, not just maybe in 100 years or maybe 50 years to come. So please, let's move on to the next slide again. So before we move on to other topics, I will you know, ask us this question. What would you do right you know, as an individual if an average human lifetime, including yours, is a thousand years? You know? So let's have a brief discussion around that. I'm sorry I'm not be able you know, to manage the time well because I want it to be interactive. So please, the mic might go to anyone who will just tell us what he or she is going to be doing right. We just have one minute to manage that. Thank you. You don't need to be right. You don't need to be wrong. So feel free. Just we want to have a tour of our imagination. OK. Um, know. Personally, for me, I would be eating right. Mm. I'd be eating proper, you know, food. I would I also plant my own food and make sure they're good without any form of chemical and the rest of them. Thank you very much. She is going to be living light as some, you know, environmentalists call it. You know, making sure that what you consume is not, you know, affecting the environment and others. That's a good way to go as an individual. Yes. I would spend more time protesting poor governance 
um, and challenging governance systems. <laughs> yeah, thank you for trying to do that, but I think our civic spaces are shrinking in Africa. As we speak, some guys are being tried for, you know, protesting against and bad governance in Nigeria. And I also know that in Kenya, we failed to, you know, pass the message as young people. So it's good to protest, but I think given these challenges that we have in a democratic setting, I'm not discouraging you, but we need to have that at the back of our mind. So thank you for sharing that. Please, let's move to the next slide. So I'm trying to make, you know, walk us through the various angles from which I think maybe any of us here may be, you know, figuring or imagining the long-term future, you know, and the grounds on which we might want to, you know, safeguard it. So for instance, on some spiritual grounds, you know, religion, many of us believe in God or gods. So based on that, there are some injunctions that, you know, prohibit us from doing things harmful to our environment. So we'll look at that later. Then this is, there's another one which is on intergenerational fairness ground, which the major proponent is John Rawls. And we have sustainability ground, which is globally, you know, recognized. And also moral ground, you know, on the aspect of being a good, good ancestor, which is, you know, by Roman Nars. Then we move on to risk ground, which many of us here in the, this room are aware of, because I'm sure that many of us have read a lot about Toby Arch. Then we move on to responsibility ground, Will Macaskill. And also the last one, which is creating traction today, is legal ground. Because as we speak today, we are talking about the Declaration on Future Generations, which we adopted in Wales, we produced, sorry, in Wales six months ago, which is a kind of international framework on how to learn good example in protecting the right of future generations. So please, next slide. So uh, this is religious ground. And one of my favorite Christian authors is, used to be Jonathan Edwards, a Puritan in the you know, early system of the US. You know, then he believed that in this sermon, when God created you and gave you reasonable soul, he made you for an endless existence. So as we move on, you will see the concept of afterlife, how it changes our perspective in terms of how we you know, interact with future. Then when you look at the Quran, for instance, the book is believed to be a guide for mankind. When we are talking about mankind, it's not just you and I. It includes those that will come maybe 100 years later, 200 years later. Then when you look at the mad concept in African setting, you know, the uh, African goddess mad believe in, you know, trust, justice, order, righteousness, base, and harmony in, you know, with regards to the universe. So this is part of what we will see later, maybe on sustainability ground, that we as human beings, we need to live in harmony with nature. So thank you, next slide, please. Then we are going to look at intergenerational justice ground, which is, you know, the area of John Rawls, an American, you know, philosopher. And he believed that we should do unto future generations what we would have past generations do unto us. Then we have the sustainability ground, which is being translated today into a future agenda at the global level, you know. And as we are all aware, we'll be having a summit of the future in this September, but unfortunately I won't be going because uh, the U.S. Embassy believes that there is a huge flight risk. I won't come back to Nigeria because Nigeria is difficult, so sorry about that. But this is, you know, these are the systemic challenges that we face as African. And as I speak, uh, by the year 100, 200, you know, we'll be having more than 42% of African people that will be born here on the continent. So what are we doing about that? Then please, next slide. Then we have the idea of good ancestor, being someone that, you know, cares about your own generation, their own generation, and so on and so forth. So 
The Good Ancestor is a kind of book that proposes that kind of long-term thinking. So we have about risk ground by Toby Ott, and the book, The Precipice, makes a strong case for, you know, trying to uh, mitigate global catastrophic risk, including climate change, you know, AI, and other risks that are man made. Please, next slide. Then we have Will McCaskill, who is actually someone that resurfaced the idea of long termism. You know, that's how he carved it. You know, the fact that it is a, a kind of moral responsibility for us to shape the future for the countless billions that will come in the future. Then we have the legal ground, which is very, very interesting. And as we speak, there are cases being instituted as at various Supreme Court by young people to make sure that the use of natural resources are not depleted, you know, in terms of conserving whatever is there for future generation and also making sure that, you know, they are not, you know, used unsustainably. So this is one of a, the, you know, principle from a Supreme Court ruling from, you know, Pakistan on how, you know, young people want nature and environment to be treated. Please, next slide. Then, this is another way why we are having challenges with deciding between the pre our present needs and long-term goals. So, I don't have much time. Maybe you have the opportunity to look at the slide. So, we have what we have been, they have been talking about. In terms of long-term thinking, the idea of, you know, deep time humility. And this comes from Roman and also what drives us in short-termism, meaning that we make policies that addresses issues of today or maybe tomorrow or five years while we discount you know their effect on the future so these are two ways that, that we face the tug of war for time as it is called please next slide then we have a men we are having a mental tour i wish we had more time so this is our public life this is our personal life for instance testing takes seconds and we do that and there are various ways that we spend our time in seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, and all that. So the concept of cathedral thinking is really important when you want to think about long-termism. Then what are the global trends in safeguarding the long-term future? At the national level, we have the world's, you know, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales, which is one of the only countries in the world that take the interests of future generations into account by public and private bodies. So, at the international level, we have the common agenda, which with the pact for the future, which is going to be a kind of global document taking into account future issues. Next slide, please. Then we have some various efforts. For instance, the most amazing that I think it's future library, you know. It means that some people are going to write manuscripts, and those manuscripts will be made into books hundred years later. So these are exciting ideas that make us think about the long-term future. Among the few that I am not willing to go through everything. Then in Africa, what I and others are doing, you know, in this space. We came up with Partnership for Future Generations in Africa, and our purpose is to promote intergenerational fair policy advocacy on the continent, and also do some capacity building for young people in terms of futures literacy, strategic foresight, long-term thinking, and others. Then we are going to be campaigning for African well-being goals. That is where it is important for us as African, because those that deny us visa, they believe that we don't enjoy well-being. So <laughs> definitely, if we are promoting our own well-being goals, you know, it will be easier for us to travel you know, because there is pleasure and experience in traveling, but we have been denied that for some years. Then the Impact Coalition is another interesting, uh, some, you know, umbrella that under which we are working so far, uh, which I'm co-leading with Jacob from Wales and Ashani from the US. So what we are doing is that we believe that knowledge aggregation is important, sharing knowledge on future and providing young people with platform making national champions and others for us to be able to embed intergenerational fairness in our policies. Then finally, this is where I will enjoin everybody to make 
to speak. So what is your attitude towards the future? And how can you positively shape the future? Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, insightful presentation. Uh, we still have time for questions and if there are additional inputs from the speaker or the audience, uh, do we f the floor is open. We have about 30 minutes to round up his session before Mr. Ibrahim Garba uh, take to the podium. Thank you, Alimi, for your presentation. I was wondering um, what your insights are on what is the differentiating factor when we're talking about safeguarding future generations in Africa as opposed to future generations generally. So because we're looking to make sure the world is you know, good for everyone, but what, what is the difference when we're having this con discussion in the continent? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Natalie. I think uh, Africa's stakes in the future is huge. And when look at, we, you look at our governance system, there is deficits in delivering to the people. So if we make it a case of a continent, it means that we see the risk as very, very high. And we want to make sure that we cry, we cry louder than any other on the, in the world so that we can be able to be heard and make sure that there are you know, policies that are intergenerationally fair for you know, young people like us and for those that will come in the future because future generations, where I think I'm a very strong critic of that definition, they say those that are yet to be born. So tell me, if I s define those that are yet to be born now, so that means Maybe in one hour later, we'll talk about future generations, right? Those that will be born. So this is where I have challenge with that definition of the UN. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if I've captured or answered your question, but I think the fact that we have like 40% of those that will be born in 100 years are going to be born in Africa makes it a kind of compelling case for us to start advocating for better policies, you know, better healthcare system, you know, human capacity development, and making sure that we have what we need to tap into the potential of young people that will shape the future. So I hope I've been able to. <laughs> Thank you. Very controversial um, point I'm about to make, but because you're effective altruists here and um, systemic um, interventions are sort of a no-go zone, Given that the problems in the continent are systemic and ideally future generations will inherit it unless those problems are dealt with, how do we then shape the agenda for what is prioritized within Africa in, under that umbrella? Yeah, I, I, I think I've, I've written a post on EA Forum where I, sorry to say, I criticize the whole EA, EA community as being, you know, we are driving a kind of dominant narrative within the EA, you know, looking at things from the global north perspective. You know, if you look at the cost prioritization or cost areas of intervention, you know, I, I'm sorry to say they are not in, you know, in tandem with the reality of our continent, you know. So this is where we need to re reshape the narrative and make cases of intervention or programs looking at our contests you know of each continent let me give you an example there is an, an EA organization that is coming up what they want to do is they want to fight terrorism you know in West Africa and they I think they have conducted research on finding where the fundings are coming from you know terrorism funding and they came they I don't know came up with the idea that cigarette, you know, illicit traffic of cigarette is one way of, you know, funding terrorism, and they want to, you know, you know, advocate for increasing taxes for cigarettes so that, you know, it will be difficult for this channel, you know, supply chain to move freely. So this is one aspect of it. 
But when the project was about to be implemented, it met some you know, stiff challenges on the continent. For instance, in Benin, it was about to start there. But the fact that they came up with that idea, you know, without including locals in the project, alienated you know, them from being able to achieve what they want to achieve. So if generally the EA community, we are looking at things from one angle and not trying to understand or be context specific in our interventions, then we might be having a dialogue, sorry, a monologue with Africa instead of having a dialogue with EA in Africa. Sorry, this is my own view. I don't know if there are some contrary view as regards how interventions in Africa needs to take into consideration realities in Africa, you know, so that, and one thing I am against is that we don't need to, you know, rely on funding from, you know, the global north to run our project on the continent. Because he who feeds you controls you. So that is where we are today. I like the, I like the focus of the partnership as far as uh, bottom-up is concerned, because once you're able to sort policy, it's easier for it to have um, ripple effect. However, one of the things that we've learned from local organizing is that there are certain levels of change that actually happen uh, bottom up. So if we look at, if you, if we look at safeguarding the long-term future from a bottom up perspective, what needs to change? What are the actions that need to happen? What can a, an ordinary person on the street of Abuja, on the street of um, Nasarawa, do today, right now, that will in the long term have an effect on the long term future? So let me answer so that, we, you know, there is currently a debate on GMO in Nigeria, particularly. And also, I was in Kenya in May, I saw the greenness of the city. But at the same time, for the UN Civil Society Conference, African leaders were there for, I think, fertilizer something at that time. So I was asking myself, why do we need fertilizers? You know, I grew up in a village. You know, my experience is that when you, for some time, you leave that space to regenerate, and maybe one year later, you come back to it. So it comes with, you know, biodiversity, which we are losing today. So if you are telling, you know, farmers that one, they should use synthetic, you know, whatever we call it, and all that, it is not actually increasing productivity in the long run. So we are talking about farming on our continent. Are we supposed to be hungry in Africa? So these are questions. Your answer to what an individual can do, a common man can do, it depends on, is that, is that, okay. <laughs> is that, you know, that's why I try to break it down from perspective. For instance, you know, some that believe in afterlife, you know, they know that being unjust to other human being is something that is a burden that will be carried to the afterlife. So these are basic ways that we can do. For instance, as a Muslim, I'm not allowed to stain a, a river or a running water. So these are basic things that, you know, it depends on your culture, of course, how you interact with nature and how you look at the future. So, but in our own context, what we think we are doing for young people to shift that mindset is that we do what we call futures literacy training, where we take young people, you know, on a course to see that you are not you don't you are not supposed to be hopeless because your government is not doing well imagine the future in a, in a different way how can you influence it so i think we have a pilot project with the copenhagen institute for future studies where we train i think at least 30 young people from africa on futures literacy and we look forward to replicating such experience while also trying to have what we call resident coordinator ambassador sorry for future generations in all the 54 African countries where we can do a kind of grassroots movement of thinking about intergenerational fairness and long-term governance. So I'm not sure if I was able to satisfy. 
Thank you so much. Uh, my own is just like a rider to what uh, he said and then what you have been saying the other time. Uh, I think what thing I notice about Africa is that we like copy and paste. And that's the problem that we are having presently. Because it's difficult for us to even define or identify ourselves. If you look at our democracy, I think there was a particular time that Chief Obasanjo was asking that Africa should define their own democracy. Because you can't just be continue copy and paste when you have a diva environment. You understand? You mentioned Kenya, you mentioned Nigeria, and some other, uh, other countries. The issue of climate change, you know, is Africa is just paying for what we, the sins that we are not committed, so to say. <laughs> because, exactly. So, I work as a uh, climate uh, activist. But most time, if I'm talking to people, maybe in the rural communities, they look at me that, okay, you said we should plant trees. We are planting trees. You said we should do this. We are doing it. Even is the issue of fertilizers, they have their own solution before. Before we bring this idea of synthetic fertilizer, which is also contributing to uh, em em emission. So all these things, I think the way forward now, is it how, are we, con going, to, are we, con are we going to continue like this? If we are continuing like this, which kind of future are we trying to... Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. As we speak, I think there is a legislation in Kenya that forbids sharing seeds. If my colleague lawyer over there would... I think you are nodding, so I'm not lying. So what it means is that we don't have policy autonomy on the continent. So it means that le legislations can em imprison a farmer that saves its own seed for the next season because they don't believe in the quality of African seeds. You know, whereas we, well, let me not go there. So I hope you, un you understand. So future is that we need to take ownership of our own agenda. We need to take ownership of how we interact with our government because that is where the major change will come from. Are we civically engaged as you and I as citizens or we just watch? Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Alabi has exhausted his time. So those of you that have questions to ask should meet him personally. He'll be with us throughout today and tomorrow. So you will have ample time and opportunity to meet him for your questions.